We're so glad you joined us for a walk in the garden. I'm Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance. Welcome to gardeners across the United States and to our international guests as well. As we all adapt to the challenges and restrictions of the coronavirus, we hope that these weekly virtual walks in the garden will add a bit of beauty to your day and inspire you to visit, create, and enjoy gardens in your area when allowed. Today I'd like to introduce Trevor Smith, who will take us on a special Earth Day garden walk, Save the Pollinators, Save the Planet. Trevor is passionate about the natural world, which inspires his commitment to ecological principles and practices. Trevor creates beautiful ecological landscapes that provide clients with an oasis for reconnecting with nature. Welcome, Trevor. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, Penny. Um, it's exciting to be able to be here. It's exciting to be able to share all of this with you. I wish that I could be live in front of you because that is what I prefer. Uh, I really thrive off of that interaction. However, I am so happy to not be wearing a mask right now because that has just been driving me crazy. So I am very happy to be mask free. Um, we are going to get into um, pollinators from a number of different angles. And um, we are going to then end with how pollinator gardens can save the planet, which you may not have ever thought about but it's absolutely true in the smallest postage stamp in the city or on a large estate in the country and everything in between, everything that we do on our property can help make a difference in climate change. So welcome, thank you, and I'm excited to crank through some, some fun information with you. So to start off, this is a slide, if you've ever seen me present before, you've seen this before, and this is one of my most important slides. So, I do not use the word sustainability in that I do not practice sustainable landscaping. I practice regenerative land care. If you look at sustainability and say our climate and our current condition as having the flu or having the coronavirus, you don't want to sustain having the coronavirus or the flu. You want to get all of your systems healthy and then sustain. So my approach to the landscape, my profession and the natural world is that sustainability is something, a level that we should look to earn or to look to achieve. And on our way to achieving sustainability, we are going to practice regeneration. We're going to get all of Earth's systems healthy, back online, and then and only then do I believe we can practice sustainability. And that, my friends, is how a tomato is born. Thank you very much. My name is Trevor Smith. It has been wonderful teaching you about pollinators and pollination. It has been a pleasure. According to the U.S., we have 100, 103 million acres of land um, tied up in residential areas, and uh, that is has probably increased exponentially since 2012. So with all of those acres of land, this is my supporting evidence that we can make a huge difference. And it's almost our responsibility since being the dominant species on earth, it's almost our responsibility to use that land to help uh, all other species on earth. There are two types of pollination, abiotic and biotic. Abiotic pollination 
refers to what would happen with grasses, sedges, conifers, and deciduous trees. This is where uh, trees will release their pollen and that pollen carried by wind and that pollen just dropped with, uh, within, within the plant itself will pollinate the plant, but the plant is not reliant on anything, say, other than the wind uh, to pollinate itself. We will be discussing today biotic pollination, which that is pollination that requires the assistance of a pollinator species to transfer the pollen from one part of the plant or from one plant to another. 90% of wild flowering plants depend on biotic pollination. And this is provided by bees, butterflies, wasps, moths, birds, bats, and other animals. Approximately 100 different food crops produced in the US depend upon pollination. Now, this is something that we, anybody who's watching this, of course, that's something that you're aware of, and you probably even shared a meme once or twice about all the crops that would be gone uh, if it were not for our bees and our pollinators. What we don't seem to always understand and what we need to drive home to people is that plants need pollinators, but pollinators also need plants. And if you are designing a garden and in, in design, it is important and a point that I need to drive home is that you need to design as if you are a part of nature. Not just for nature, design like you are a part of nature and not apart from nature. Much of what has gotten us into the situation that we are in, I, per, I believe, is that we have been designing as apart from nature. So it's when we design for as if we are a part of that we will achieve the most success. So why are pollinator gardens important? <clears throat> well, as natural habitats decrease, as we've talked about, um, th the pollinator species are becoming uh, significantly threatened. They provide food, water, and shelter, and places for pollinators and other animals to raise their young. Pollinator gardens are, are important to the planet for carbon sequestration, water filtration, erosion control, ecological biodiversity, soil health, and reducing the heat island effect. Now, the three things, or four, the four pieces here that I focus most on in my business is the carbon sequestration, water filtration, soil health, and urban heat island effect. So here are the basics. We gotta cover the basics. You need to go over the basics before you can move on. So we are just gonna float through the basics and enjoy the pictures as we go. So unsustainable landscapes. Plant diversity is minimal. Non-native plants. Ornamental species used in the garden. A sustainable pollinator garden, diverse flowering native plant palette is used uh, for, you know, for the garden. And by diverse flower native plant palette, yes, we're talking about native species, but we're also making sure that there is pollen and nectar available for the pollinators at all time of the season. An unsustainable landscape will have heavy soil cover. This is a mistake often made even by the most well-intentioned landscape company and or homeowner, whoever you may be, we need to leave bare areas because many of our native bees are ground nesting. So it is important to have some untouched or bare areas for our pollinator species. Unsustainable landscapes don't offer any water for wildlife. In a sustainable landscape, there are many types of water sources because everybody drinks differently. Not all, like birds and bees and everybody can't all drink from a bird bath. Some can, but some won't. Some just need moisture off of rocks or small puddles. So it's important to think when you're thinking about your landscape that you have a diversity of water sources available um, for the, the many species that inhabit your garden. Unsustainable landscapes, thickets and hedges frequently maintained, requiring intensive maintenance. We call this crimes against horticulture. Native, sustainable landscapes have native plants that are minimally maintained and that will act as wind blocks or nesting habitats. One of my favorite books growing up 
and you may or may not be familiar with it, but you should definitely check it out, is Where Do Butterflies Go in the Rain? I always loved, I loved that story, and we need to, you know, create places for butterflies to go when, when it rains. Unsustainable landscapes. Lawns, we all know this. If you're on this, on this presentation, we all know that lawns are definitely a threat uh, to our pollinator communities and to wildlife. It is important to reduce the size of our lawns, create a diverse plant species, uh, including flower and ground covers and forbs. Unsustainable lawn care. This actually totally hits home right now because just two days ago, I was on a client's property and a uh, company that everybody knows, but I will not name, showed up and the guy was asking if he could spray the lawn. Um, for uh, broadleaf weeds uh, and a fertilizer, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, is, is it dangerous? He said, you, don't, you definitely don't wanna touch it. You know, I've asked her to keep her dog inside. If it gets on your skin, wash it off because it'll certainly create a rash. This guy went around the whole property, sprayed the entire property. What was heartbreaking is the moment he left, all the robins came back down and started rooting through the grass. And I was thinking, how is this even a thing? Like, how, how, could he, how can he in good conscience do that? How can a company in good conscience do that? It just, it just didn't, didn't seem right, and it was very disheartening and heartbreaking to see. So a sustainable uh, landscape uh, will not use chemicals at all, if as much, and when they are used, they are used with great responsibility. Unsustainable landscapes. Buying willy-nilly from, say, big box stores that may use neonicotinoids. Um, check your labels. It doesn't even have to be big box stores. They are usually the, the greatest offenders, but check your labels even on your, your corner nursery, etc. And make sure they don't use neonics because it's not something you can see. It's not something you're going to know. Um, just as in this day and age, many of us are... Um, proactive about food allergies and what might be in our food, reading the label, et cetera. We need to do that if we're going to be responsible land stewards and either ask the question or read the label to see if neonics were used um, and make sure that we use uh, neonic free products because that is just going to be detrimental. No matter how beautiful the garden will be, it will be the most colorful killer we've ever seen. So let us talk about the menu. This right here, easily Googleable, but is something that I always find very helpful. Uh, anytime I am working in the landscape or designing um, pollinator gardens and looking for pollinator species or trying to make sure that I have encouraged everything. Here we have bees. Bees are, connect, are drawn to bright white, yellow, blue, or anything that reflects the UV. Nectar guides present. The, they love the fresh, mild, pleasant odor of plants. <clears throat> but they're also looking into the flower shapes. And this is that last row is the one that I usually use the most to find the flower shapes to make sure that the flower choices that I have picked for my pollinator garden are all inclusive and that there's something for everybody. Um, sometimes I can get carried away and I'll be throwing things in and then realize I've totally like boxed out, um, you know, a, a, a pollinator species because I don't have their preferred flower shape in there. So I find this chart uh, just great to help remind me. Flies are, you know, they're, they're one that we do not think of very often. We will talk about them later. But um, if anybody's familiar with the pawpaw tree, pawpaws are pollinated um, by flies. Skunk cabbage is pollinated by flies. Uh, one, um, one thing that could happen, you know, one that could happen with climate change, one um, that we need to worry about is the species emerging out of sync with the plants flowering. 
And it's not always, again, it's not always something we think about. We think about losing the plants. We think about losing the species themselves uh, due to construction and building up the landscape or improper landscaping. But where climate change comes into play is if plants start flowering out of sync with their pollinator species. And uh, skunk cabbage is definitely one of those because it comes up so early uh, and it calls two specific flies to pollinate it. So bees get their protein from the pollen it eats in the process of foraging. They incidentally transport pollen from one flower to another. Nectar is the sugary uh, secretion produced by the plants. Nectar is utilized as an energy source. Bees do rely on nectar, though bees are not dependent on nectar as much as wasps, butterflies, moths, and hunting, hummingbirds. So we, we're dealing with, when we're dealing with pollinators and when we're dealing with creating pollinator gardens, we have to look to both pollen and nectar. So our native bees, the ones that I'm sure many of you on this presentation right now are familiar with, but on the whole, our native bees are the ones that are, go, are very much forgotten. The honeybee and the monarch are the, are the poster children for pollinator gardens and pollinators. And there is a whole slew of other pollinators in there that we need to take into consideration. Over 20,000 bee types considered wild. What makes them so great is they come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, they're prolific pollinators, able to see UV, attracted to white, uh, blue, and yellow flowers. One of the reasons, just fun side note, one of the reasons you don't see many bees caught in spider webs are because spider webs um, reflect UV light. So bees can see in UV as birds can as well. It is thought that one of the reasons that that it happened under evolution is so that large animals like bees and or birds wouldn't go flying through spider webs and they would get destroyed and they would have to connect them over and over again. But one of the things that like the biomimicry community is arguing for is putting a UV glaze over our windows to minimize bird strikes. So just interesting little side fact. Honeybees, the poster child used mostly for agriculture, <clears throat> critical for pollination of fruits, vegetables, and nut plants, over 2 million colonies in the US. Hired honeybees contribute over 14 billion annually to the agriculture industry. My grandfather used to keep honeybees. Uh, I am definitely you know, a, a fan of all honeybees have to offer. I do believe the industry needs to become a little more um, be friendly and not, and understand that yes we are hiring these bees so that we need to treat our bees a little bit better but it's not just bees we have bats beetles moths wasps flies and hummingbirds so let's look at wasps <clears throat> wasps go after nectar closely related to bees and ants because as they visit flowers they carry pollen, pollen with them on their bodies, but they are not as hairy as, say, bees, so they do not collect as much pollen, so they're not as prolific um, as, the, as they fly from one to the other. But we want wasps because they are a predatory species, and they will ensure that our pollinator garden will thrive because they will be eating things like the aphids um, that threatened to uh, crash our pollinator garden. And the wasps are attracted to blue, white, yellow, and they tend to avoid red. So the butterflies. <clears throat> butterflies are funny because everybody wants the butterflies, but butterflies, as far as pollination is concerned, uh, they are not the strongest pollinator. Um, they, they do not play a huge role. They do not take much pollen with them uh, as they flip from flower to flower, uh, collecting nectar. 
but they certainly are definitely the most beautiful uh, in the pollinator garden. Attracted to red, orange, and purple. Uh, it's definitely a good sign in your garden if you do have multiple species of butterflies. And yes, there is more than the monarch. Uh, and it's, it's great when you start to look into that and start to figure out um, how you can attract different ones. That's something that bringing nature home really got me interested in when I read it all those years ago. I was like, oh, so I can really just set out a menu and almost attract, you know, the different butterflies that I would like to see. Moths. Moths are attracted to our white flowers. They are, they are also nectar sippers, but moths are fuzzy, so they do um, spread more pollen than, say, a butterfly will. <clears throat> moths are mostly nocturnal. The difference between moths and butterflies, moths are fuzzy. And the reason that moths are fuzzy and butterflies aren't is because the fuzz on a moth actually throws off the echolocation of bats. So it makes sense that if you've evolved to fly around at night to do all of your feeding and do all of your business, that you would be provided with some armor or come up with some armor to protect you uh, from the other species that may be flying around at night. Hummingbirds. I live in Arlington and my neighbors on both sides and numerous people that I know in Arlington are hummingbird fanatics. Um, we get a few. I see a few here and there. Um, I hope most of you have much more success with your um, hummingbird gardens or attracting hummingbirds to your pollinator gardens. Keen sense of sight, poor sense of smell. They are attracted to your red, orange, and yellow flowers. They do not do much in the ways of pollination. They do carry pollen from flower to flower on their feathers, but again, uh, they are not the, the big pollinators. Bats. Bats as pollinators are mostly a tropical spe in, in tropical countries, tropical species. As it says here, um, most of their pollination and everything is used when it comes to bananas and, and many tropical fruits, but they are also needed and necessary um, for plants used for fiber, timber, and other things. So bats, you wouldn't think, but they are very important pollinators. And beetles are the most prolific. Beetles, we see beetles in our garden and we freak out. But they are the most prolific pollinator species. Um, the US Forest Service estimates beetles are responsible for pollinating 88% of um, flowering crops or flowering plants globally. They are amongst the oldest known pollinator species <clears throat> dating, dating back to the Mesoic period about 200 million years ago. So as people were watching plants, they were understanding that the beetles played heavy pollinators. They are called mess and soil pollinators, as it says here. They're called mess and soil pollinators because they chew, they chew their way through the petals. They're messing up the petals. They litter the ground with chewed petals and they also just defecate within the flowers, which makes the garden um, not, as, not as pretty. But they definitely benefit the garden, benefit the soil, and they are the most prolific pollinators. So don't hate on the beetles when you see them creeping around in your garden. And they are attracted to sweet, spicy, or fermented smelling flowers. But they do not have a shake preference. And the flies, as we talked about earlier. <clears throat> flies serve, serve as indicators for water quality around in the area. They're most attracted in orchards. Flies play the biggest role in areas where bees and butterflies are not so existent. So more like alpine areas, <clears throat> flies are responsible for much of the pollination. And as you can see, they are contributed to putrid and rotting smelling things. So again, 
the beetles and the flies, we don't think about them as much and we don't think about attracting them as much, but they do play a heavy role. And if you are going to create a pollinator garden, you should create your pollinator garden for all pollinators, not just say the monarch. So let's go through types of gardens. Container gardens. The benefits of container gardens. Low cost, low commitment, mobile, easy to use. So the ecological community can make an argument for saying using annuals uh, is not an ecological practice. Personally, I will use annuals in containers for a number of reasons. When you are looking to attract pollinators and keep pollinators, it is good to have something always flowering. Also, as you can see, say in this picture, the Gardenmeister fuchsia, fuchsia uh, is something that will keep those hummingbirds uh, interested. So I think with the ability to continue bloom as the perennials ebb and flow, to continue a food source as perennials ebb and flow throughout the season, um, a container garden is definitely great. Also, if you only have a balcony, a container garden is a great thing because you can do your part on a fourth floor balcony in the middle of New York, in the middle of Boston, wherever you might be, you can still play your part um, in, in um, saving the pollinators. Mixed borders, definitely can't do that on a balcony, need a little more land for that. <clears throat> but the benefits of a mixed border are a variety of extended bloom times, low maintenance. Now we're getting into carbon sequestration, water infiltration, and habitat. So the, with, with the mixed borders, with the mix of the shrubs and the perennials and all of those mixed bloom times and mixed root zones, uh, you are able to start really reaping ecological as well as pollinator benefits. Meadows, which was the hot topic at this year's ELA conference and seems to be one of the buzzwords and things that everybody is interested in. Meadows are just awesome, of course, for pollinators. <clears throat> the benefits are with all those extended bloom times, they are relatively low maintenance. The carbon sequestration and water infiltration with meadows is huge, um, rivaling that of the mixed border. Uh, and now you are providing so much habitat um, for many different pollinators as well as other wildlife. And the host garden. The host garden is the most neglected garden. Everybody, when they plant their pollinator gardens, when I see pollinator gardens planted in public, say at a, at a library or something, um, when I consult on pollinator garden lists, uh, et cetera, people forget to feed the, the larvae and the, and the caterpillar stages of those caterpillars, I mean, of those, of those butterflies and of those moths. Everybody wants the moths and everybody wants the uh, bees and butterflies coming to their gardens, but you need to have the food. And if you have, for instance, here we have the monarch, but we also have a black, black swallowtail. If you have that food there, you are going to have more butterflies in your pollinator garden. I had the opportunity to visit Penny Lewis's house last summer and she had chrysalis everywhere hanging off her house, hanging off every, every plant going on. She was definitely feeding the uh, pollinators and they were absolutely loving life. And there were moths and butterflies all over that property, doing it right. So how to attract more pollinators when it comes to food? Select plants that are beneficial. Like I said, using that chart, plant native plants, Minimize the use of non-native plants and think before planting cultivars. So when you're thinking about your pollinator food, think about who you want to attract. If you want it to be 
butterflies and hummingbirds, then you're going to use more tubular nectar plants. If you want to have your bees and your native bees, then you're going to want to have open um, pollen producing plants. So think about those. And of course, you know, these insects evolved with certain plants. So their best source of pollen, their best source of nectar will be from a native plant and not necessarily a non-native plant. And certain cultivars lose um, lose either their, their pollen count or their nectar as they've been cultivated to make prettier flowers. So you might have gorgeous flowers, but the pollen count's gonna be significantly lower and you're not gonna attract and you're not going to feed your pollinators uh, as you would think. So when it comes to water, when it comes to water, it's necessary to provide water in a variety of applications for a variety of pollinator types. So bird baths, shallow dishes, bubblers, fountains, ponds, streams, any type of water that you can think of uh, that is not deep enough, um, even like little puddles in your garden that is not deep enough that will not um, attract mosquitoes uh, is something that you should consider. Uh, for instance, here with this fountain, we can get birds and certain, um, certain species will come to the surface where the water is and actually land on the rim and drink from the surface. But things like bees and many of the butterflies land in the splash zone and get their moisture off the, off the wet rocks around. Water is one of the best things that you can bring into a landscape, whether it be a fountain, pond, pondless waterfall, whatever that may be. The sound of water attracts wildlife like you can't believe, um, and water is life. So if you have water in your backyard, you are going to have a whole lot of life in your backyard. And it's important when you're designing your pollinator garden to think about having water available for the pollinators as they come to visit leaving areas for puddling. This is one of the things that we, um, I, we touched on earlier. We're big on mulching. We're big on covering, covering our soil. And in doing so, we eliminate um, potential nesting areas for some of the bees. And um, if we don't leave little depressions and areas for puddling, again, we are eliminating water because puddling areas produce you know, a, safe, a safe space for like butterflies and moths to rehydrate. They don't need a whole lot of water, it just needs to be damp as we talked about on the rocks. Uh, a small dish filled with dirt or sand or flat stones, all these things. You can either put them out in dishes and make them a part of your garden or you can just create little indentations mulch free that water can collect um, in your pollinator garden. But again, we get focused so much on the flowers and we forget about all the other needs of these species. So a simple indentation that will hold moisture when the garden gets watered is great. How to attract more pollinators, shelter. Incorporate areas for shelter protection for your pollinators. You do not necessarily need to build yourself a giant bee bug hotel, um, but having dead logs left around, drilling holes in, in either logs or pieces of wood, having little niches, and again, having those bare areas for the ground nesters is all very important. Uh, if there's no place to live, then there's gonna, have, there's gonna be no reason for them to choose your garden and your, um, to, set up, to set up their family. using dead, <clears throat> drying trees, shrubs, ornamental grasses, things found on site. Um, I've worked with many of my clients and some, some it took longer than others, but convinced them to not cut back um, in the fall or cut, you know, only cut back their perennials in high vis areas where they don't wanna get the stink eye from the neighbor all of my clients um, 
leave the leaves currently, which is very important. If you want a, a lunar moth, it is important that you leave the leaves. Otherwise, you will not have uh, lunar moths because that's where they're going to overwinter and spend the first stages of their life. Come spring, when everybody's doing cleanups, you know, it's important. And I encourage my clients to, to not go out and call their, you know, the, their um, professionals right away. Uh, if they if they hire somebody else to cut down their gardens, because that usually starts happening. It's already started happening now. It usually starts happening in early April when everybody's still asleep and we haven't had that many warm days. So if they insist on it, I ask that they leave at least six inches uh, of the of the stems of whatever is cut back um, in in hopes to leave some of the hibernating uh, pollinators there because it's just heartbreaking to think about you know when you leave when you leave the leaves and leave all this up and then they just you know right before the warm days hit and all these insects emerge it's just heartbreaking to think that they all got toted away just before they were about to come out for spring So now we get into how does a pollinator garden save the world? And you may not have thought about your pollinator garden saving the world. We are dealing with climate change, but climate change is not the problem. Climate change is a symptom. CO2 and excess CO2 is not the problem. Excess CO2 is a symptom. Disruption in the carbon and hydrological cycle is the problem. We don't have a flooding problem. We have an infiltration problem. So as, as a species, as, as, a, as designers, and uh, as municipalities now, we are pointing the finger at and blaming the wrong things. We are seeing images like this and saying that we have major flooding problems. What this is, is poor design and poor infiltration. So I want you to ask yourself, where does a tree come from? Think about that, let that marinate, and we'll come back to that. Where I believe we need to focus with our gardens, with every piece of property that we tend, and where I, need, where I believe we need to focus our energy is on the soil carbon sponge, the carbon cycle and the hydrological cycle. And I am going to make my case right now in the next few slides. So this is what good soil looks like. 25% air, 25% water, 45% sand, silt, and clay, 5% organic matter. That organic matter breaks out into dead and way dead, which would be humus, um, and then 25% actively decomposing, and then living roots and organisms. But what happens if we increase our soil organic matter. Let's just say we up it from 5% to 10%. For every 1% increase in soil organic matter, soil will hold 20 to 25,000 gallons of water per acre. So now we're solving our infiltration problem. Now we're solving our our water scarcity problem because we won't need as much irrigation if we can hold that much water in our soil. If we can hold water in our soil, our plants will thrive. With water in the soil, we have increased soil life. When we have water in the soil and increased soil life, we have increased photosynthesis. We all are very aware of the soil food web. <clears throat> And that in the soil and in a teaspoon of soil, there's more things living and happening in a teaspoon of soil than there are people on earth. So I ask you again, 
where does a tree come from? Since you can't answer, I'm just going to tell you. Trees and plants come from thin air. They don't come from the soil. Trees and plants come from thin air. Photo freaking synthesis. This is how photosynthesis is the building blocks of life and how everything from trees and plants to you and I are created from carbon. Carbon is not our enemy. The carbon is taken from the air, turned into sugar, and pushed into the ground to create the building blocks of life. If trees were created from the ground, then the soil around a tree would be getting used up and we'd have giant holes in the ground. This is just something very elementary, but we don't think of it. It doesn't really occur to us that trees and plants are made from thin air and they are made from carbon taken out of the air. This right here is the underside of every leaf. The underside of every leaf has stomata and those stomata sip all the carbon dioxide from the air. All that CO2, that little CO2 monster just sips away all day long, collecting that carbon. And then that carbon gets turned into sugar and sent down into the soil. This is, a, this is the part that we most often know and that you're probably like, okay, here we go. But we, again, we have to make that connection and think about it. That carbon goes into the soil, that carbon in the soil, or that, those sugars in the root exudates feed the soil life. The soil life grows and proliferates it, within the soil. The tree grows because feeding the soil life, it gets the sugar and minerals it needs. Just because a root is touching a rock does not mean that it can take up the minerals that it needs. It needs life in the soil. It needs water in the soil. And again, if we have water in the soil and if we fix our infiltration, <clears throat> then we can increase photosynthesis. And it's just a big cycle. So with the more photosynthesis, then we have more carbon sequestration and we have more life in the soil and it just goes around and around. So those carbohydrates are sent down in the root exudates in exchange for minerals and water. And then the tree uses those minerals and water to grow. And then all of that going down and as the soil life grows and everything else, now we are increasing carbon within the soil itself. So this right here on the left would just be a plant <clears throat> without its fungal community, without its soil friends and without its neighborhood. This is what a landscape pretty much looks like. And this is what much of our farmland looks like. When you have to use fertilizers to grow your landscape, especially synthetic fertilizers, this is what your soil looks like. When you introduce your plant into a healthy, happy neighborhood, it becomes part of the neighborhood and everybody helps out everybody else. And if somebody needs a cup of sugar, boom, that cup of sugar is right there and the exchange goes on and on and on. Our bare soil is another contributor to climate change. When we have bare soil in this area, at least in my area, what I see the most is during these construction projects when they're building a subdivision they'll have 10 acres or so stripped absolutely naked well all of that carbon dioxide is is oxidizing and getting released into the air that's contributing to climate change it's not just the fossil fuels all the farmland when we leave when, when we leave soil naked or when we till our soils in the farmland we release the carbon dioxide that was trapped from the previous slides in the soil it's released back into the air that's car causing excess carbon dioxide in the air when we have heavily planted soils we have a nice exchange 
the carbon dioxide that's released from the soil is captured by the plants and put back down into the soil. 25% of solar radiation is transferred back into space through transpiration. Again, this is how your little pollinator garden can help save the world. Because by reflecting that solar radiation back, we can help cool the planet. <clears throat> when we have multi-species multi of diverse uh, plant species and healthy soil, we have water infiltration. And then those plants through evapotranspiration will put that water uh, back into the air, which cools our environment. When we have hard compacted or bare soils, when we have excess turf, then we have water runoff. And now we're losing that precious water. One third of solar radiation is reflected back by clouds. So the more evapotranspiration we have, the more clouds we have, the cooler our planet becomes. So through, ev through evapotranspiration and transpiration and through clouds, now we can significantly cool our planet, much more so than asphalt, built environment, and bare soil. So by taking all of these steps, by doing all of these things, we become a more resilient planet. We have more resilient communities. We become drought resilient, fire resilient, flood resilient. With healthy soil, we have more moisture in the soil, as we just described. With biodiversity, we restore our ecosystems and ecosystem function, getting us on our way to sustainability. So even in our little pollinator garden, we need to be thinking of all of these things. And our little pollinator garden will be taking in CO2, sequestering carbon from the air and putting it in the soil. And the healthier the soil, the more water, the more water, the more photosynthesis, the cooler planet we have. Thank you very much. And I'll be very happy to take any questions should you have them. Thanks, Trevor. That was fabulous. We have several questions. The first is about how we contend with beetles and having them as pollinators in our gardens versus having them devour our gardens. So this is a two-pronged approach. By having healthy soil and healthy hydrology within your soil, you will have healthy plants. Insects, their job, much of their job, beetles and, and uh, insects uh, of the such, their job is to eliminate weak plant material. So if you have a healthy plant, your plant is creating complete proteins and the majority of insects cannot digest complete proteins. So your, your plants are more beetle resistant or more insect resistant and more insect resilient if they are able to create complete proteins through photosynthesis. So you will have beetles nibble and there is an acceptable threshold because we, we need to have everybody in our garden. So we want to make sure that we have healthy soil and water, and then we will have beetles nibble, but not decimate. If your plants are being decimated, it's a sign that there is something off either with the water or with your soil, and your plant is stressed. And so the beetle thinks it's doing what it's supposed to do and just get that plant out of the way for a much stronger plant. So um, there, is, there is that portion of it. And Penny, can you just repeat the question one more time? Because there was a second part that I wanted to say. Uh, it was just, how do we have them as pollinators versus devouring the plants? And I think you covered that. Yeah, definitely. 
All right. Are Japanese beetles pollinators? They seem to be pretty destructive in my garden. Okay, so the answer is, the short answer would be yes, because as the Japanese beetles move around and as they are destructive, pollination does happen, but they are definitely um, a more destructive beetle. I am, cer I certainly am not saying that I love and, and welcome and worship all beetles that come in my garden. However, every beetle that is in your garden is not your enemy. Now, I would have to say a Japanese beetle is certainly not a friend uh, in anybody's garden. Um, they were not on my mind, actually, when I was waxing so poetically about beetles, interestingly enough. Uh, so, yes, I think a Japanese beetle, it's best to control them. But again, they're doing what they are supposed to do. And inadvertently, yes, they are pollinating. All right, very good. We have many questions about water. Uh, questions about how deep and what types of pollinators can access what different water sources. Maybe you can go over that a little bit. Um, I, I, I certainly can a little bit. Um, so as far as, say, the puddles while we're creating, when I create a pollinator garden or even just a perennial bed, because ultimately... I mean, I know pollinator gardens have become a a thing, like they're separate. But if you are just creating a perennial bed or a mixed border, uh, you are essentially creating a pollinator garden. And if you create your perennial bed or mixed border with intention, then much part of that intention is for pollinators. But in when creating a bed and say I'm mulching, towards the back of the bed or towards the middle of the bed, I will leave those bare areas that we talk about for nesting. Sometimes I will make sure that there is some sort of a depression. Um, if you have irrigation going, that little, that little depression. So butterflies and bees, they just need like a muddy puddle. If you want to put a dish out of sand, uh, so you don't need to have standing water. If you want to just put like a, a coffee lid out with some sand in it, that holds water or that you refill, bees and butterflies will get their moisture from that. If you have a fountain, um, they will be getting their moisture from the rocks in the splash zone. While say the birds will be landing on the edge of the fountain probably and drinking from the fountain itself. But um, many different you know sizes and depths. So if you want to just, if you don't want to put dishes out, then I suggest just creating little depressions that can get muddy um, and that are naked for the bees and butterflies, moths to access, or you can put little dishes out, how, whatever little dish you choose, and fill that either with, um, say, soil or sand and create that little muddy dish itself and just nestle that somewhere and that will be uh, accessible for the moths and butterflies and bees. Okay. Thank you. One of the other questions is about how to provide a water source for pollinators that doesn't lead to problems with mosquito populations. Okay, well, the, what we just discussed is definitely one way. Um, fountains, pondless waterfalls, and um, properly constructed water gardens are all ways to um, to to accomplish that, ponds do not lead to uh, mosquito population. Actually, ponds lead to dragonfly population, which will really reduce and bird population. So that will really reduce the mosquitoes in your area. Uh, I found with every water garden that I've created, the uh, the predator population goes up and the mosquito population actually goes down. Um, so those are not breeding sites. You want to just eliminate, of course, stagnant water and water that goes um, neglected. So it's fine to have a bird bath if you want to have a bird bath and not necessarily a water feature, but you need to make sure that you are changing that water over and that you don't just fill it and let it sit. It takes about 36 hours 
for mosquitoes to set in. So you really need to change your water out every 24 if you're going to have, say, a bird bath or, or the like. Very good. Very good suggestion. Can you explain how flies in, are indicators of water quality? So flies, um, flies, when you have healthy water sources around, or yeah, I guess even unhealthy in the case of mosquitoes, but when you have uh, healthy water sources around, you will have a diverse um, population of flies. Uh, they do much of their breeding in and around water sources. Not, it's not just mosquitoes. So um, if you have a healthy, diverse population of flies, it is an indicator that you have um, or either nearby or you have on your property um, a quality water source. I don't know if that fully answered okay. the question. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, what about attracting grasshoppers and cicadas and other beneficial bugs? So um, I don't really know about cicadas because they have such an interesting um, lifestyle. Grasshoppers will come to your unkempt areas. So that would provide uh, plenty of food for, say, a bird population. So if you have areas of lawn um, that you just let go or mow infrequently, you will have a, a much higher uh, grasshopper population. Like I said, as far as cicadas, I don't know because they just seem to be around and they spend so long in the ground, I'm not really sure, aside from having healthy soil, what would draw cicadas um, to your site. Okay, thank you. Do you have any thoughts on ozone layer and air quality, how best to improve air quality, and where do the emissions go? So the best thing you can do is to plant something, especially a tree but to plant something. As far as ozone layer is concerned, the more we um, kind of uh, clean up our act, we can, that will help with the ozone layer. My focus and is mostly in, in the planting that I do and in the, uh, in, in the talks and teaching that I do is focused on carbon emissions because I feel we have blamed fossil fuel, which is responsible, fossil fuel does play a role in our say, global warming or in our, in our climate change. It certainly does, but it is not the only thing. And the best thing we can do is to reduce our carbon emissions, but also increase our planting and increase our water infiltration because we can have healthier uh, plants if we, if we have more water in the soil and the healthier the plants, the more carbon they will draw down and put into the soil. But uh, as I said in the, in the talk, things like fallow fields, things like massive construction uh, and wildfires are uh, at least two, because two of them are the same, the fallow fields and the construction. Carbon oxid oxidization from naked soil and the wildfires we've been having are both contributing to climate change. But as the wildfires say in, you know, Australia burned for almost a half a year, as that went on and on, nobody was thinking, oh, that's contributing to climate change. We all just kept blaming the cars. Now, if we have healthier soil and more water infiltration, healthier plants and resilient communities, we'll have fewer fires. So we need that water infiltration Again, so that we won't have the, all those dry areas as much, and we will have fewer fires. So all of those things are contributing, and the best thing you can do as just a, a single person is to plant more and encourage healthy soil because you will be storing carbon from the atmosphere in your soil. Even if you live on a postage stamp, you're doing something. Okay, very good. 
When in April is the appropriate time to clean up the garden beds uh, and fallen leaves without harming overwintering insects? I always give a week of warm weather. We haven't quite had it yet, so uh, my beds are pretty much untouched. Some of them I, uh, I started to cut back a little bit, um, but for the most part, I've left mine significantly untouched. I go for about a week of warmer weather, you know, 60 degrees, once it starts to level out, because then they're going to start to emerge. But I saw landscape crews out there cleaning as early as the last week of March, first week of April. And, you know, we all we have a habit of sweeping away all the leaf litter, uh, et cetera. We kind of over clean our landscape and we're in it's that is a direct assault on the the pollinator community. So we can plant all the flowers we want. But if we are killing all the overwintering pollinators, then we are destroying the populations. And it doesn't matter how many flowers you have in your garden. So. I mean, I don't know that there's a fast rule of thumb. I'm, I'm certainly not an entomologist, but I usually wait for a week of warm weather to let everybody kind of wake up, and get out and get going. And then, like I said, when I cut back, I usually cut back to about six inches because as the plants start to grow, then, you know, that, that all gets covered up and decomposes over the course of the year. Many beds that don't need to be uber beautiful, I will cut back and I will leave all the stems. Uh, I have one client who is kind of, uh, wants to save the planet, but also wants a really clean garden. So for them, I've suggested that they cut back all of the, all of their perennials in the spring to give them that uber clean garden that they're looking for, but they take all of the stems and they set them off to the side in a remote corner of their property and just let that sit there, either let it decompose or they just let it sit there until it's been warm for like a month or so. And then we just take it away. So you can either hide, hide your, your, your debris in within the garden if you can, or take it somewhere else if you don't want to have like an ugly place, but it's, it needs to be understood that, you know, for instance, the lunar moth is going to be living in that leaf litter. So if the guys come through, or if the crews come through and they blow away every single last leaf, that was this year's lunar moth. So we need to just be careful of that and aware of that and adjust our standards. Good, good advice. We have a couple of questions about having uh, bare ground for ground nesters and to support pollinators and other questions about what size that should be because you also explained to us that we shouldn't have bare soil because that contributes to carbon loss. So the bare soil contributing to carbon loss is much different. That's on a larger, um, on a larger scale when I'm when I'm speaking of like construction, farmland, uh, you know, large pieces within within a pollinator garden within. So, for instance, if I'm mulching, say, a perennial border. I will definitely have have the front mulch, the part you can see, and then mid to back bed, I might leave an area open. And it can be, it can vary in size because, I mean, a bee doesn't need that large an area. So if it's one square foot, two square feet, or if you're just light on the mulch in the back um, where they can still get to the soil. It's, and I also use leaf mulch very much for those reasons. Um, because if you have two inches of a heavy bark layer, the bees have no access whatsoever. So if bark is your thing, or wood chips really, wood chip mulch is your thing, then I would leave sections, little, just little, little tiny areas, not massive swaths, but little tiny areas that bees can get to. Uh, and, at, you know, prefer, you know, and some in the sun and some in the shade, because everybody likes something different. But these aren't noticeable. I'm not talking like even tens of feet, just little tiny squares that disappear as the perennials come up. You don't really see them. But as you're going through the garden, 
there's just a little naked area and what you'll start to see is that you know you'll have friends setting up setting up their homes in in those little areas and you you'll definitely notice the increase in in the pollinator population excellent thank you what happens to trees planted near beaches or on barrier islands where the root systems can't go deep into the soil i don't fully understand the question i mean the tree will set their root system uh accordingly um carbon sequestration will still happen by by the tree itself growing um that is carbon sequestration happening and it's uh, our goal is to maintain the carbon in the soil and not constantly lose it again by you know digging it up tilling it over uh etc um, but trees will establish their own their own root systems on barrier islands on ledge you know we trees will grow on on top of rocks as as we've seen so i mean they'll just they'll establish whatever root system they can you know for their survival either way they will be pumping carbon into the soil as they grow um it it may just not be as as deep but then the denizens of the soil it is their responsibility to move the carbon around to lock it away and to utilize it okay very good uh where do yellow jackets fall into the pollinator realm and what is their place in the ecosystem yellow jackets are awesome predators um this is i had to i had to come around with my relationship i had two incidences uh when i was young of encountering yellow jacket nests once with a lawnmower and i got uh over 80 stings um so i had to really come around as far as yellow jackets were concerned but yellow jackets are awesome predators um they pollinate just as any other wasp does they spend their time uh, on the flowers. Yellow jackets during the season are pretty mellow. Uh, again, unless you unless you disturb their nests, yellow jackets during the season are pretty mellow. It's in the fall that they get very cranky and very aggressive, and that is because they have spent the entire summer raising their brood. They are uh, nutrition starved, so they're hangry come fall. Uh, and they know winter's coming, so it's it's really they're they're hangry. The buffet is closing, so they ha are a little more aggressive than, in the fall than they would be at any other time. And that's when you just need to be a little more cautious. But they are wasps are extremely important. They take care of so many of our nuisance insects: those beetles, those aphids, anything that may be eating the plants. Um, one thing you may or may not know is as a plant as something is nibbling on a plant uh, that plant will send out um, a signal to wasps around um, calling them in and letting them know that something is nibbling on them they they release uh, chemicals into the air that wasps as they're flying around are monitoring for they pick that up that plant says hey over here somebody's nibbling on me and boom that wasp is in there and taking care of of uh, all those all those predators you know just as with peonies uh the, you know it's not the ants that actually open the peony bloom but the peony as it's growing releases little sugars that the ant loves so the peony is giving the ant sugar and in exchange anything that messes with the peony the ant attacks right away because it's like hey now you're messing with my food source so it's these symbiotic relationships that exist throughout nature that make the world just such a cool place. Excellent. Can you talk a little bit about the increased bee populations that we're trying to encourage for pollination and whether or not that increases bee sting potential in the garden? Um, I think similar to shark attacks 
bees and bee stings are kind of overrated. Um, I w have been working for 20 years in and amongst flowers in the landscape, and I can count on one hand the number of times I've been stung. Every time has had to do with disturbing a nest. For instance, I was stung last year, but I was weeding a uh, overgrown garden um, for a client and happened to pull a sapling out and disturb a bumblebee nest. I would attack me too. I felt really bad for, for doing that. Um, and knowing that, the, you know, especially thinking that those bees might die because I, I really meant no harm. Uh, other times that I've been stung mostly happens at nurseries with bees that have made their nests in the bottom of, uh, of pots. And as I move the plant, um, you know, they come flying out of the bottom of the pot and, and, have, and have attacked me. But, you know, I've, I'm outside all the time and amongst bees all the time and pretty mellow and don't get stung that often. It does happen. It will happen. But I think if you're careful, if you're respectful, um, it, it won't happen that much. And especially our native bee population, bees are not the aggressive ones. It's more wasps that we need to be careful of. And many of our native bee populations, some of them just don't at all, if or rarely ever, uh, sting. You know, I mean, you can you can walk in a meadow amongst lots and lots of bumblebees, and nothing will ever happen. Um, like I said, it's only when you disturb their nest or threaten them, and then you know what, you can't blame them. So I think we should encourage, and we should definitely teach our children, uh, you know, not to be afraid, but just be wary. And be, be wary and respectful of, of all of nature and, you know, understand that it has a role to play. But if you respect it, then and if you're wary of it, then you should absolutely be fine. But I think there's this unnecessary fear of being outside and being amongst flowers. I get asked all the time to create flower gardens that won't attract bees. And I have to explain to clients that that's not a thing, that you, you can't have one without the other and that the bees are not something to be afraid of. So I, again, I think we just need to, we need to adjust. And yes, it's, it's awful to get stung. And especially if you're allergic, to, it can be terrible. But if you take the right precautions, you should be okay. Very good. Are carpenter bees on the positive pollinator side or are they just uh, damaging houses? If a carpenter bee is eating its way through my deck or my clapboards or something like that, it is not really my friend. Um, however, the carpenter bees that are making nests and eating their way through the dead wood that I may have on a client's property or my property or logs that I leave, um, they are absolutely doing their thing. They don't know that they're drilling into your house. It's not intentional. We, we look at these pests and we see it as intentional. You know, maybe there is no alternative around and, you know, that's, that's just, you know, what you're going to do. But it's not, it's not a, we have, we have to stop seeing these things as malicious attacks. <laughs> but, you no, know, I mean, if a carpenter bee is eating my house, then I'm, I'm not a fan of it, at, you know, at all. It still serves a role in the ecosystem. And I'm going to hope that, you know, other carpenter bees will find their ways into trees and dead snags. Although if we keep sanitizing the landscape, those things won't be around. Okay. Do you have a recommendation for um, eliminating invasive fire ants? No, I do not because I have, am not from a part of the states that has anything to do with fire ants so i don't have an answer on that i have been asked that question before but i don't have enough experience to give a solid answer i expect perhaps a google search would help turn up some good information yeah i think an ecological landscaper from an area that has fire ants would be able to give you a great uh, great response that you that would fit your morals Very good. We have a low spot in our yard that ponds during the rain and is covered with moss. 
Do you have any suggestions for what we could do to make this even more attractive to pollinators? Well, we, you do not want the that area to be ponded too long because you certainly do not want mosquitoes. Um, I think if you have an area on your property that collects a little bit of water, that is all you need to do because those pollinators and the rest of nature will seek out any sort of water source. Like I said, if you want a lot of wildlife in your backyard, have have a water source. It's exactly... Yeah, and and everybody will come. Um, so I think if you have something naturally occurring, and it is not a nuisance and it is not a mosquito breeding ground, then I would absolutely say you've done enough, and I would leave it alone. Okay, good. Can you speak a little bit about planting winter rye or clover to cover bare garden areas in the winter? Uh, I can speak a bit to this. So, um, bear garden areas and or, um, you know, food production areas, it is great to, uh, to definitely seed in some sort of cover crop. Um, I suggest if you do not want to see that cover crop coming back, even if it's an annual crop that you uh, cut it, before it goes to seed, but for as long as you have living roots in the soil, you are feeding the life within the soil and you're sequestering carbon. So if you have an area that will be bare, let's just say you let's just say you tend a public garden or a an area that is planted with annuals and or vegetable crops. If it's you know, if you seed that with a clover or seed that with an annual something like a winter rye, and, and you can get away with that. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan because you don't want to leave that soil fallow. And again, for as long as you have living roots, and this should go with also in designing your pollinator garden, have things that persist in into the colder months. Men, you know, mainly up here in in the northeast, things like asters and things um, that will will hold on. Um, and keep keep living roots in the soil uh, into into the later months and keep producing food. But winter rye, clover, um, you know, hairy vetch or buckwheat, any of those cover crops, uh, as long as you are careful, especially in a small area, uh, not to let them go to seed. I think they're they're very important. They help stop erosion. They do provide flour um, constantly. So it's, I think it's a, it's a great idea. Again, you just gotta be careful with them. Okay, very good. Can you talk a little bit about micro clover and other, uh, other ways to add diversity to your lawn? Absolutely, I'm actually designing two lawn, diverse lawns or lawn alternatives um, right now using micro clover or white clover. Uh, I'm also working in uh, viola, one in viola in the form of Johnny Jump Ups, and the other viola in the form of violets, uh, multi-species violets, so there's lots of cover uh, and color. <clears throat> but I am a big fan of multi-green uh, in a lawn. You don't necessarily need a monoculture clover, but by having all of those blooms and those blooms at different times, it's great, it's great for the pollinators. It's great for the soil, uh, and it's great for the uh, the species around it. So, uh, big fan and big fan of working in, like I said, things like um, viola in the form of Johnny Jump Ups is is great at a time like this. And by the time they pass, you're mowing your lawn, so they're fine and they've already spread their seed. Clover and violets don't come up that high, so they're never a problem. But having that flower out there is awesome. Uh, if you look into medicinal things, white clover and violets are all great for food and medicinal uh, reasons as well. But I, I love the idea and encourage so many of my clients to either accept the diverse lawn they have or encourage them to plant a diverse lawn. Um, so big fan. And I would just look into some of your favorite low grow flowers uh, and work those um, work those in. 
and the micro clover white clover is is definitely a, a standard that i think should always be in there especially um alternative driveways which is something that we also do um if you have driving strips or an alternative driveway clover is something that is extremely resilient and can take the beating of a car and continue to bounce back so that is that is also a good one in uh, harsher situations like that or if you're going to have a planted driveway using a uh, plantable system and would you also include wild strawberry in these lawn alternative mixes absolutely that won't that definitely that won't come as a seed probably but um depending on where you're going to be ha having that wild strawberry i think uh i think is great and i'm a big fan uh, of a, of a tapestry if you kind of have a green tapestry that has little flowers that you know that come and go but all this wonderful texture that can take some foot traffic that can let you be out there barefoot um and earthing grounding you know and connecting with the earth uh is is a, a wonderful thing and i think encourages people to be out there so yeah wild strawberry i haven't don't have a lot of experience with walking on that barefoot i've planted it in areas with not a lot of foot traffic um but the the clover etc you know definitely i've been all over that barefoot and that's really fun okay very good time too creeping if time animals... we're creeping time in is that's all we, if you get some creeping time seed and work that into a lawn it'll really thrive in the sunny areas it stays low you don't really know it's there until you go cruising across your lawn and then you just get hit with all that fragrance okay uh you mentioned uh using annuals and planters for longer term bloom we've had a couple of questions about what specifically would you recommend for plants and another question asking you to clarify whether or not there is pollen in them that is good for the pollinators okay so um the containers uh mostly are really just the billboard to get them in the door as far as far as i see it um so things like for for instance annuals uh the drag like dragon wing i think it's a dragon wing begonias garden meister fuchsia like you will get if you want hummingbirds that's a great way to further attract hummingbirds um while the flowers on whatever else you have uh come and go it's a great way to keep something bright red and nectar rich there for your hummingbirds um really uh you, you know having the color the big thing with the annuals is watching out for the neonics and um just pl planting that uh that variety so i mean i i just went off on some shade stuff there's plenty of um there's plenty of other annuals, but most of the, many of the annuals that have been super hybridized, just like the perennials, uh, they don't have super rich pollen sources, but it gets them in the door. So it's that flashing neon sign. And then while they're there, they'll find whatever pollinator it might be, will find something else. But if you get responsibly grown annuals and uh, have a variety of them around, uh you will definitely you know you will attract your pollinators and they'll 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 go looking uh at least and depending on what it is it, they may or may not find the pollen i don't have necess uh like pollen counts of many of the things i say just plant with your favorites i do know about the dragon wing and the garden meister because um i have a client that's that's their favorite and it's their favorite because they get hummingbirds all the time uh, every time I plant those so uh, that's that's what they now request as their standard okay very good do you have a recommendation for vigorous native plants that would help stave off uh, 
invasives like bittersweet and multiflora rose and buckthorns that would provide pollinator support. So I do not have a, there isn't like a, a not certainly not a ground cover that I can think of. Um, you really do just need to plant my my uh, approach to reducing invasives is planting heavily so that that seed bank never sees the light of day and the seeds that do make a start before the uh, native plants get going uh, I'm able to get in there and take care of those but uh, you know buckthorn is the, I mean, all of all of them, they're just, there's something that you need to keep an eye on and it, it, it is ongoing. However, the thicker you plant, the heavier you plant, the, um, the less of a problem you are going to have. So by having a, a, a native ground cover, pick your favorite, we'll say strawberry in this example. Um, if you have your native strawberry running around, if you have large suckering shrubs, um, like an Itea, like certain viburnums, things that will get, or um, buckeye, um, things that will get very full and will just shade out and take over. That's going to be that's going to be your best bet. And then just being vigilant that somebody's not growing up within those shrubs. And again, having densely planted perennials. Uh, will also just keep that seed bank down. So when you go through and you do your thing, you'll have to do some maintenance and pull out those seedlings. But you can bet that over the course of the year with a heavily planted garden, you won't have many, um, many seedlings shooting up uh, over the course of the season once your native garden gets going. Very good. Uh, can you talk a little bit about riparian buffers and how they might support pollinators? Absolutely, because I'm doing one right now. So with a riparian buffer, um, the one that I'm designing right now, it's really I've just worked in a number of native species that will like an average to wet soil condition that like part shade, you know, where I'm working is part shade to shade, but I mean, it's good to work in the part shade zone. And again, it's in choosing your plants, choose plants with different bloom times, look into the plant and choose plants that are host plants to certain species um, and make sure that you have just a variety in there, in both perennial and woody. Um, in you know in riparian zones you you want to have your perennial your woody and your ground cover because you're going to need erosion control as well so you want to have an active ground cover like dewberry is one that i'm designing with um you, you have like an active ground cover that's going to prevent erosion multiple soil depths which will open up the soil making it more receptive to uh infiltrating water multiple soil depths i mean root depths will um, encourage a whole lot more soil life because they'll be injecting exudates two feet down and they'll be injecting exudates two inches down. So especially, but in those riparian zones, just as with, you know, with any other landscape, kind of look into what each shrub does. So instead of just designing for aesthetics or each plant does, I'm sorry, instead of just designing for aesthetics, be like, okay, I'd like to use a woodland phlox. Who likes woodland flocks? Or do I have anything else that's blooming at the same time as these? And if something else is blooming at the same time, is it the same flower shape? Or can I be providing a different shape for a different species? And I think if you start looking into your plantings like that, like I said, designing for nature, and as if you are a part of nature, um, rather than just putting your, your interests first, I think you're gonna wind up with an absolutely gorgeous garden that will be um, beneficial to many different species. Very good. If you're planting host plants like parsley for swallowtail butterflies, where should you plant them? And are you inadvertently just attracting more birds that are going to eat the caterpillars 
to get the butterflies. That is the circle of life. So that's <laughs> that's something that I think needs to be celebrated because having more birds and having healthy bird populations shows that you have a healthy insect population, and that is just that is just a wonderful thing. Um, depending on my garden and depending on my budget, sometimes in a remote corner or say the back area of the garden, sometimes I'll just fling a bunch of seed like fennel seed or whichever, uh, and just let that come up in and amongst wherever it comes up. That would be the cheapest. Things like parsley and the such, sometimes I will just intentionally plant them uh, in the open spaces of the garden. Um, yes, it's good to put them in there. I put them in there, not really. It's just, it's gonna do what it's gonna do. So I will plant it in there. And once it's gone, it's gone. And it's, I really, you know, I have, um, you know, no qualms about it being eaten. That's, that's what it's there for. Sometimes it, it doesn't get totally devoured and it does really well. Uh, some things reseed and come back every year and end up adding, for instance, like the fennels will add really fun texture and flower. And as they reseed throughout the garden, they're actually kind of pretty and kind of a surprise. And then every now and then it gets totally decimated and that's cool. But yes, the birds, the birds will definitely be there and the birds will definitely be doing their thing. That's why the more you can have, the better off you are. Okay, very good. Can you recommend a resource to do more study about carbon sequestration with perennials, grasses, and shrubs? Um, I do not have a one resource. My information has come from experimentation and listening to a lot of uh, great people in the industry. Much of the carbon sequestration work that is being done is actually in the regenerative farming industry and you can learn a whole lot from the uh, regenerative ag. The Bionutrient Food Association is a good place to go for a lot of information um, on regenerative ag and carbon sequestration. Uh, it hasn't totally spilled over and I'm hoping that it will more and more um, into the landscape community, but um, currently, it's not the it's not the hottest topic. So the best place you're going to have to kind of hunt around for your information, and it is that's it's actually a wonderful rabbit hole to go down um, because it gets pretty exciting. And what you can do is you can take the information you learn in the agriculture community and really start to just apply it to your landscape because you're just dealing with plants. Um, so you can just start applying that information to the landscape, and you can see the correlations. And actually, a perennial bed is much better than a annual crop in many ways because it will stay and just continue to keep pumping carbon into the soil rather than having to restart every year. But um, I would definitely look into that community. Bionutrient Food Association, um, Advancing Eco Agriculture, John Kempf, are, he's, he's very big into carbon sequestration. Um, Michael Phillips, another one, talk, you can talk about carbon sequestration. So in just searching around, you'll, you'll get your information, but I can't say, oh, read this book because my information has come just from lots of little bites here and there. All right, very good. Can you talk a little bit about biochar and how that could improve the soil and carbon sequestration? Sure, I was wondering and I was kind of hoping that there was going to be a biochar question. Um, biochar, when used responsibly, I think is a excellent uh, soil amendment and resource, no matter what type of planting you're doing. Mixed bed, container, agriculture. Um, I, I'm a big fan of biochar using it. Um, it 
only benefits the soil. It holds the nutrients and holds the water in the soil. It facilitates the carbon and hydrological cycle that we spoke about and, uh, you know, essentially adds little vaults within the soil to hold all of these nutrients and all of these exudates and, and make them available. And it just grows the, uh, the community down there. You can't, you, more is not better when it comes to biochar um, from bioswales and rain gardens to raised beds. I stay in about a 2% ratio um, as, as I'm adding it. You don't need a lot. You need to find a good source of biochar. Um, one great source of biochar is organic mechanic soils. They they have a consistent, some of the most consistent biochar that I've found. Um, other resources that I've found are not consistent enough with their feedstock or um, with with the product that they that they're producing. But I've found if you want a biochar in a bag, say uh, organic mechanics is a great uh, is a great resource. Um, Black owl biochar out in Washington. They're a West Coast, but they also are very good. I think it's Black Owl, Black, something like that. Um, they're on the West Coast, but they are a good resource for biochar. Um, and but like I said, more is not more is not better. So a little bit incorporated here and there will definitely facilitate carbon sequestration. Okay, very good. If animals and insects such as hummingbirds and butterflies are less prolific pollinators, how else or in what other ways do they benefit plants? Um, well, I mean, as the as the hummingbirds, the hummingbirds do carry pollen um, somewhat. I mean, they're attracted to the deep tubular nectar plants so there's not a whole lot of pollen going on there but as they zip about they do pick up some pollen and spread it around um butterflies do as well a little bit but just like wasps etc they're just not it's they're not like bees i mean bees with all their little hairs um just get covered in pollen and just take it everywhere um definitely there was an image in in the slideshow of just a bumblebee that was just, it looked like it was covered in snow. I mean, just bees, bees are just end up being um, the best when it comes to that. Um, but it's it's great to have them because every little bit helps and every everybody does something. Um, you know, the bees aren't going to the same flowers that the butterflies are going to. So the butterflies are important um, because they're providing, you know, pollination on, on a whole other level. And they're pollinating plants that bees don't visit as often. Same as the hummingbirds, same as the bats, you know. So everybody has their their go-to um, plants. Again, just as that, that chart described, everybody has their, their favorite colors and their favorite flavors. And I think that's why we need diversity. And that's why I encourage people to get away from hey, honeybees are the end-all be-all, or hey, monarchs are the end-all be-all. Do we want to save them? Do we want to encourage them? Absolutely. My own, the only thing on my bucket list is someday to get to Mexico and to see all the monarchs, and I hope they're there when I can finally make it. But that is the only thing on my bucket list. You know, I am a big, you know, want to save the monarch person. However, you know, there are so many other cool butterflies out there, so many other cool moths out there that I just try to, through this, I was just trying to open everybody's eyes and get them excited about like the green sweat bee. Because when you look at that jade bee kind of buzzing around on, in the picture, it was Stratoscanthia, you know, that deep purple flower. It's just like, that's, that's a beautiful combination. And they're just all these wonderful things. I spend I spend much of my time just walking around with the phone. Many of those images you saw, it's just me walking around with my phone as I'm checking out a client's garden, just recording who I see there and hoping more and more that every year when I go back, I'm gonna see somebody I didn't see there before. You know, I spend much of my time just m paying more attention to that. Probably should be paying more attention to like the weeds that might be coming up, but I get so distracted by all the pretty buzzing around that, uh, 
you know, I'd probably miss a couple, but that's definitely just something to pay attention to. You know, as this season progresses, notice notice who's there, notice who you have, you know, and then plant for maybe those you don't have. All right. Uh, do you happen to have a source for the statistic that you gave about 25% of solar radiation being put back into space by evapotranspiration? Someone would like to do a little more research on that. Okay, that's based on the research done by Walter Jane. I can't remember how to spell his last name. Walter Jane, he's an Australian climate uh, professor, climatologist, and um, he's he's done a lot as far as how um, enhancing the soil can help with carbon sequestration. Uh, Dee Dee Pursehaus is another one to look into. She's um, covered many of those things, but that statistic came from the research done by Walter Jane. Um, and I I stumbled upon him through my stormwater research, and in, in trying to increase infiltration, I inadvertently learned all about how water infiltration can lead to better carbon sequestration. So, okay, very good. Can you recommend a source for? information about beetle identification so that we know what we're looking at when we see them in the garden? I cannot. I, okay. I, wish, I, I wish I could, but I don't have a go to this website um, for, for beetle ID. And I think it also depends on the, um, the area of the country or the world that you're in, you know, looking up um, you know, beetles in my area, you know, would be definitely sure. the best way to go about that. Take right. pictures. Uh, what is your feeling about purchasing beneficial insects like ladybug, ladybugs to release into gardens? Um, I don't know that it's as effective as we might think it is. Um, so I think in, say, greenhouses, that works a whole lot better. Releasing them into gardens, if they do stay, um, they will take care of the, say, the aphid population that's there, but once that's there, then they're gone. So I think by having, uh, by concentrating on a diversity of plants, by concentrating on having healthy plants and again, having a diversity of water sources and shelter um, within your garden, those species will come. I don't know, I mean, I don't know how effective it is and what a great investment it is because I, I, I certainly don't know that th there's any proof that they hang out. In a greenhouse, they're captive and the greenhouse suffers a lot from those types of pests like aphids. Um, but in, in your garden, I don't know how long the ladybugs hang out, so I don't know that it's, it's worth the money to do it. I think just having a diverse population, including those wasps, will, um, will help. Okay. Uh, someone has been seeing a fly that seems to lay eggs that hatch into little green worms and eat the viburnums and hibiscus leaves. Can you tell us what those might be? I cannot just off the top of my head, especially not knowing where we are in the country. And I also don't necessarily have that problem. I have somebody different eating hibiscus at a client's house and though people caution a lot about planting viburnum. It's one of my favorite plants and I don't have any problems and I have it planted pretty much all over Massachusetts and parts other parts of New England. So I've never had a problem with it. Okay. 
Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's okay. We have a couple of questions about bindweed. And since it has flowers and there seem to be a lot of pollinators on it, should we just leave it or should we just fight it? Well, that That's one I would say fight. You know, it's things like bindweed, even, you know, all invasives. Like the thing that we have to understand is they are providing a ecological function. The carbon sequestration, they either have flowers or they're do they're all doing something. They're just it's not something that we want. So, you know, swallow wart, bindweed, you know, any of that, I'd say fight it, you know, to the best of your ability. Yes, if it flowers, it's going to provide pollen for for pollinators, but I'm pretty sure you probably have a whole lot else in the garden that will too. So Okay. Uh, we have a couple of folks who have contributed suggestions for the beetle identification question. One is www.inaturalist.org. That is a great resource for identification. And another suggestion is bugguide.net. So thank you for those. The next question, and we are coming to the end, is um, where can I find the chart that you presented on different plants and times of bloom? You can, if you Google pollinator syndrome, it, will, it should come up. OK. All right. We have one more recommendation. For Insect ID, it's Garden Insects of North America by Whitney Cranshaw. And apparently that has really great beetle and other insect ID resources. And the last is a comment. And it says, Trevor, can you please train all of the landscape companies in the country with all of this wonderful information you have just provided? Thank you very much. That is quite a compliment, and that actually is the the underlying a, a the unspoken mission, I guess, in as far as ELA is concerned, by getting this information out there. If you are a homeowner, you have this information, and you can require it and ask of it of your landscape professional. If you are a designer, you can do the same, and the more people who ask and require it, then Again, you're, you're basically voting with your dollars. And those who bother to get the knowledge, those who bother to learn and really hone their craft will be the ones who are successful. And the others, you know, should, via natural selection, um, you know, fall by the wayside. But it's a very, one of the best things about the ELA is that we are making that information available, you know, for everybody to empower themselves. Um, either in making their decisions or conducting their own business. But thank you very much. Well, thank you, Trevor. This has been wonderful. We love learning that moths have fuzzy systems to thwart off bat predation. And thank you for all of your wit and wisdom to inspire us all to save the pollinators and save the planet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.